Well, how many here have heard the other two sermons that I gave on this subject? Okay, so some of you haven't, so... Yeah, well, the subject has been... Um, well, I'll just... The first sermon was given about a vision that a man that we all, many of us know, is called Baxter Kruger had. He was in Squaw Valley, and he was standing at some beautiful uh, spot in the road, and he was looking up this long valley. Then all of a sudden, in vision, he saw a huge beaver dam going all the way across and all the way to the top. And that was his vision. Of course, like any of us would do, his immediate response was, what is this, God? Lord Jesus, what does this mean? And of course, you know, Jesus being who he is, kind of probably gave him a little bit of trouble with it. He thought about, well, it means this, must mean that, might mean this. But what it was is when you look at that dam, on the bottom were these two huge logs that cross from one side to the other side. And then on top of that is your basic beaver dam, little pieces and parts all strung together, full height. And behind it was water. So as he thought about it and listened to the Holy Spirit, it turned out the water was the Holy Spirit held back by this dam which rested on two falsehoods that Christ, Western Christianity believes. One is that God really doesn't love us. And two is that we are separated from God. Okay, those are the two great falsehoods that are being preached. Now, the interesting thing about that is the second sermon we talked about, um, does God really love us? Of course, the answer to that is yes. And he's always loved us. There has never been a time in our life when he doesn't love us. And so we talked about that first log. Think of all the, think of how we interpret scripture if you believe that God doesn't love you. Just consider that for a minute. If a human being believes God doesn't love him, how do we interpret scripture? That baseline for understanding scripture is skewed. So we see everything as something else, whatever that might be. Well, yeah, we're getting there. Okay, so with, then with that one, we went back to the Garden of Eden. As you look at that story, you see where Eve and Adam, after all this time of being with Jesus himself and him teaching them stuff, chose to take of the tree of good and evil. They chose to do that. They didn't have to. But what had happened there? Satan, who understood what their heart was, he saw that they were looking at a physical death, most likely. And when he told them, no, you won't die. That's not true. What you will have is you'll be like God. And God, who doesn't really love you, doesn't want you to be like him. If you look at the words real close, that's probably what he was getting at. And so they chose to eat of it, and you saw what happened. Well, that same situation is what spewed the other log of lies, that we were separated from God. Because immediately after that, God says to the Father and the Holy Spirit, he says, well, hey, they're like us now. They have to leave this garden unless they eat of the tree of life and live forever. God threw us out. And what happens when you're thrown out? I'll tell you what happens. All kinds of weird stuff happens. When I lost my position at Lowe's, I've gone through so many emotional upheavals. Why? Not because I lost the position, because they won't tell me why. I didn't get the new position. I've asked them many times, and they will not tell me. And when you have that kind of a thing going on in your mind, your mind just goes crazy. You think all kinds of different things. But the fact of the matter is, it boils down to one thing. That's what my Lord wanted. If he didn't want it, it wouldn't have happened. And I'm learning a whole bunch through that. So that's the two kind of what we talked about. And, you know, when you don't think God loves you, you know how it is. If you don't think your dad loves you, you don't think your mom loves you, you don't think your husband loves you or your children, all kinds of horrible things happen. All kinds of thoughts and beliefs happen that are not true. We make up all this stuff. 
and then all kinds of misery happens, and then you do something that you should have done in the first place. You sit down and you talk to the other person, and you go, oh, I took that really wrong. Well, it's kind of the same way with us and what we believe about God, which is our bottom line, your basic beliefs of God. If you believe God loves you, has always loved you, will love you, and will never leave you, and that he has never been away from you, he has always been with you, no matter what you're doing, robbing a bank, God is there. Murdering somebody, God is there. Giving birth to a child, which is not a sin, by the way, God is there, good and bad. God is always there, all three of them. Now, in these other two sermons we talked about, do we have the emblem, Rick? I should have asked earlier. I always put Rick on the spot. <laughs> Anyways, um, there's an emblem that has, it's a triangle, and it has God the Father in a circle here, Jesus Christ in a circle here, Holy Spirit in a circle here, and they're all connected. And then the, thorn of, the thorny crown of Christ around it. Now, in the center is humanity. You and me, everybody who ever was, ever will be. And God is around that person. And he's always around those people. If I go over here, God is around me. If I go over here, God is there. Wherever I go, he goes. Yeah, if it ever comes up. Anyways. Now, this, that is Eastern Trinitarian, Trinitarianism, whereas there's, we're in the middle. Now, Western Trinitarianism is a little bit different, because you have the three, but you have the Holy Spirit, and humanity is outside. So everything is done through the Holy Spirit. But when you look at Scripture and you consider what God says and what love is, in the middle is more accurate. Is it perfect? I doubt it. Will we know God ever? Yes. When we're sitting there at his feet, we will know who God is and how it works. But until then, we just keep learning. You learn a little bit here, which changes all this. Oh, okay, I understand what this is now. And as Christians, we keep going day in, day out, month in, month out. And every experience we face in our lives is to bring us closer to God. Now, today's sermon is about, are we separated from God? Back to the Garden of Eden, where this came from. Jesus and God the Father threw Adam and Eve out of the garden. But guess what? They went with him. Cain and Abel, who were they talking to? God. Who were they making sacrifices to? God. Who told them what to do? God. He was there. He never left them. He was there with them, just as he is there with you and you and you and all of us. He is here. You know, there's a scripture that says, um, let's see, how does God put it? Uh, you have to take the kingdom by force. Each and every one of us have our own battle to become like Jesus. And I really can't help you with it. I can teach you some things. I can give you stuff to think about. But that battle is you, Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And the whole thing is to become like Jesus. Who do we have in us to teach us who Jesus is? The Holy Spirit. And who does Jesus teach us about? Dad, our Father in heaven. They are all the same. And so if your baseline is, well, he doesn't love me. He leaves me alone out here. I'm struggling. He's not here. What are you going to think? How are you going to grow? How are you going to judge Scripture and everything that goes on around you? It's skewed. You know, we have a president now, President Donald Trump, who is desperately trying to keep his promises. The man says he's a Christian. I kind of believe that he probably is. And if you've watched his trying to keep his promises, the last thing that he put out was, I'm not going to deport anybody but criminals. I believe he's finally starting to understand, and this is my prayer for him, that he realizes that this is God's country. Many of us are reprobates. God doesn't care. Well, he does, but he's here with us. That everybody in this country, legal or illegal, was brought here 
by God for a reason. And that his job isn't to throw people out. His job is to meld them into society. That's his job. Yeah. You know, I mean, mercy, love, joy, peace, all the things that come. And that's my prayer for President Trump, that he will understand that somehow, some way. I can do that, and I'm sure some have, but it has to come from God. Otherwise, he won't, you know, he won't. So, when we think about all this stuff, we think about the Trinity. We're a Trinitarian congregation here, at least GCI is. And we believe that there's the Father, and almost every Christian does. We believe that there's Jesus, and every Christian does. And we believe that the Holy Spirit is an individual. And that's kind of the mix among churches. Some do, some don't. But if you look at Scripture, you see that over 200 to 300 times the Holy Spirit is mentioned. And almost every one of those, it's with, it comes with a trait of an individual. That would make a really good study. Get a concordance and go through each Scripture that mentions the Holy Spirit. It will really, really help you understand that the Holy Spirit is the one that hovered over the sea. Created all things through the Holy Spirit. He's the one that Jesus said, I'm going to send to you when me, Jesus Christ, the Comforter, is gone. After his death and resurrection. The Comforter was the Holy Spirit. And I believe everyone in this room has him with you or next to you. Once you accept Jesus and you get baptized and you tell God, here I am, let's go, he enters you. And he's yours forever. Nobody can take him away. So when we read the word of God, and as you're reading through the scripture, in your heart are you saying, these are the words of the God of love, or are these the words of a God of indifference? Because if you believe he doesn't love you, and he isn't with you, then he's a God of indifference. And it makes a big difference on how we view scripture. Okay, at the tree, Adam and Eve made a choice. Now, we all like to blame Eve for but really it was Adam's fault. That's right. He was the one that should have said no. He, he should have said, no, I'm not going to eat of that fruit. But he did. And men have been doing what women want ever since. <laughs> but anyways, when they ate of that fruit, it was like they were telling God, we don't really believe you. We don't you know, accept everything you've been teaching us. We want to do things our own way. We want to be, and then in another way, we were saying we want to be like you. We want to know good and evil. We want to know right and wrong. So at that point, something happened. You know, there's a scripture in the New Testament that says, your sins have separated you from God. And most people will tell you that that means we're separated from God because that's what God wanted. That's not the case. That's not what that says. It says our sins have separated us from God, not our sins have, separ have, have separated God from us. There's a difference. God did not do it. God did not separate. He's still there. But because of our sins, we did something. And there's an interesting, um, you know, the, this new movie that's coming out, uh, The Shack, the book. All of that is about how. God loved us, always loves us, and we've never been away from him. That is a visual attempt to show us all of what we've been talking about here. And from what I understand, he does a pretty good job. So here you are. Look at it this way, Kate. Today are kids. You walk into their rooms or into where they are, and where are they? Usually they're sitting with their head in a video game. Isn't that true? Okay, my generation, 
They'd be sitting there staring at the boob tube. Generations before, probably the radio. Before that, books. There was always something that we were into. And why is that? Because we're hiding. So here you have the Trinity, the star, you know, the triangle. You're in the middle. But you're sitting there doing this. What's God doing? He's jumping and dancing all around you. Doing what? Good deeds. Because that's what God does. And they're everywhere. They're all around you all the time. Why is he doing this? He wants your attention. And every now and then things get kind of bad in our lives and we kind of look up. And there's God and we get up and we do all kinds of dancing with him. He fixes our problems. And then we get back to him, back to our video game. And that goes on and on and on. But then after a while, we go, hmm, well, let me see if God, God's still dancing. Maybe she is still there. I thought maybe he went away and he only came back when I had problems. And that's kind of a way of seeing things that we as Christians, not so much anymore, because we're standing up more. We're dancing more with him. But as Christians, there are times we still sit down. And you can tell you're in one of those sit-down modes when you're by yourself, vegetating on something. And that's okay. We need to do that from time to time. God understands we're a human and we need time now from time to time. But the majority of our time should be up looking around. You know, there's one thing I have learned as a Christian. No matter how bad things get, good comes from it. It might not always be for me, other than seeing the good for somebody else. But it is there. And dancing with God is looking for it. Participating in it. Being part of it. Okay, if we have this view that we're separated from God and he really doesn't love us, what do we get from that? We get religion. Get religion. You know what, you know what re stands for? Put together. Religion means bind. Rebind is what that word actually meant. So if I'm separated from God, and I've been getting up and down, and I'm starting to dance more with him, and I think, well, I mean, really need to be with God. I want to be with God. How do you do that? Well, you understand that you do good deeds. You run around and start doing good deeds, and that's going to get me back to God. Religion. Reunite. That's how you do it. I tried that for a while when I was a young Christian, not understanding anything. Burn myself out terribly. You get to the point where you don't want to do nothing. You don't want to talk to God. I mean, this is just too much work. I'm done, done. And many of us have done that. Because I came from a church that taught that. They didn't mean to. They didn't understand. But that's what you're taught. You pay your tithes. You go to feast sites. You go to do all these activities. You do all this stuff. You work your tail off in the church. You do all these good deeds everywhere. And eventually you burn yourself out from it. Now, if you look at everything from the standpoint that God has always loved me, and love is an outgoing concern for others, that's what God has for us, not sex. Even though in our society, they've getting, getting kind of mixed. I'm going, to make, I'm, going to have, I'm going to make love to this girl. He means he's going to have sex with her. Because making love is doing things together, spending time together, talking, playing games, going places, talking about what makes you happy what doesn't that's making love sex is just part of that so we have made all these religions you can see them they're everywhere do this do this do this do this and you're good with god your relationship is strong but we all know that that's not true what's true is God created us all. He's always been with us. He loves us. And when the time was right, he sent someone who came to this world, lived a perfect life, died, went back to heaven, sent us the comforter. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. And the only thing that God requires of us, when you get right down to brass tacks, is the two great commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Anything else 
is sin in God's eyes. It's hard to love God when you think he hates you. He's separated from you and he doesn't love you. He can't possibly done. It brings you to another scripture. It says, you love me because I loved you first. We have to understand that he loves us. And in loving us, he will never separate himself from us. We will always be there with him. And he will always be there with us. See, I'm prancing around here because God is with me. I walk all over the place. When I drive to work, God is with me. When I'm disciplining one of my employees, God is with me. When I'm being recommended for something or praised for something, God is there. And it's not me, it's God. It's not that God sits there and plans out everything in your life, but he makes sure everything in your life teaches you something. And what is that? Be like Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you know the Father. God's love for us is infinite. He gave his only son. So what about King David? We all know the story of Bathsheba. We know what happened there. How does that show God's love for David? When he killed a baby. He killed Bathsheba's husband. I mean, God let all this happen. How do we see that as something loving? Well, out of that came a newly restored David. You know, God could have gone to David after he looked at that girl and said, the prophet could have come and said whatever he needed to say, and David probably would have responded. But why didn't God? Why did he wait so long until David had murdered this guy, stolen his wife, got her pregnant, all the stuff that he did? Where's the love in that? Now, see, God loves us so much that he has something called free moral agency. He allows us to make our mistakes. And I tried to do that with my kids. Let them make their mistake and be there to help them out of it. Did it work? I don't know. They're still growing up, I guess. They're still doing okay. But God will allow us to say no. But he does everything in his power, dancing around us like a maniac, trying to get us to say yes. See, that word try, though, I don't really care for that word. Because God doesn't try. God does. So that brings us to something we talked about in the first sermon about GCI, something you guys need to know, is we are hopeful Unitarians when it comes to salvation. We hope that God has a way to save absolutely everybody. That's a, that's a hopeful Unitarian view. But we do understand that he may allow some to perish. You know, but for us, as Christians, we don't have to worry about that. Because we're not going to perish. We are saved. Kind of gone ahead of myself a little bit. Okay, here's where we're at. As we go about our lives, there's one thing that's always, I've always had trouble with. And that is, how do I approach other people about God when he's a God of separation and he doesn't really love them? Not really. Jesus does. Okay, we can go from that. Way. But God the Father, he's the boss. And everybody on earth knows he's the boss. Scripture tells us that everybody knows just by looking at the trees and the sky and the grass and all the stuff that he's created. We all know. That's why there's no excuse for sin, for not loving him. But he allows us not to. And it struck me once that this whole thing is about understanding who God is and what he wants and how he wants to get it. It's all about love, it's all about family, and it's all about giving and faith and all the things that Christians have. 
So when I go to talk to somebody about God, I don't have to sit there and try to convince them that Jesus is the Savior of the world. I can ask them one simple question. Do you believe God loves you? If they say yes, that, that leads you off into a bunch of different thoughts. You go to church. You have Christian friends. Do you act upon that? Blah, 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 blah. If they say no, why not? And then you can take them through the understanding that God has always loved them. He has never been away from them. He will never stop loving them. And then you go through the proof, which is Jesus. Take them to the Garden of Eden. Talk about where all this came from. And if they're still listening, take them to the New Testament when Jesus comes, lives, dies, and all that that means. I tell you what, there's a rare individual that won't respond to that. Because it will be heartfelt and sincere. Because if you believe God loves you, then you believe God loves them. And your heart and soul will be, will be, they will see it in your voice. They will see it in how you talk. They will see it in the stress of your voice, how important this is, that you believe it and it's true. You know, we got a little tiny congregation here. But God can do anything with a little tiny congregation. And the more we prove to him that we love him, and how do you do that? You get up and dance with him. Look at the good deeds and thank him for it. Be involved in him when you can. And part of good deeds is not allowing yourself to become so stressed by doing good deeds that you neglect your family, you neglect your brethren, you neglect your job. Because there's good deeds all day at work when you, those of us who have jobs. Doing a good job, showing up on time, being positive, supporting the boss, even if you think he's nuts. You know, all these things are good deeds that you do all day long. And all these good deeds that the Father uses to call people to himself, because they will ask you, why are you like this? I've been asked several times, why are you so happy? Why are you so working so hard? They dumped on you, man. They gave you the boot. I said, so? They're still paying me to work hard and be this way. It's still my job to be like that. Just because I didn't get what I want doesn't mean I dump on everybody, start lazing off, hiding in the back 40, not doing anything, talking bad about everybody. No, I'm not going to do that. No, well, I would. I said, well, I won't. Why not? Because I'm a Christian. And that's not what my Lord wants me to do. And you know what? I don't want to do it either. That's the crux of Christianity. When you get to the point where you say, I'm not doing it. Not just because my Lord tells me not to, but because I'm like my Lord and I don't believe in it. Oh, good. It's almost time to quit. Okay, here's the deal. There's a couple of chapters I'd like you guys to spend some time in. Um, one is Romans 11, or the whole book of Romans, actually, but Romans 11 for sure, and John 17. Romans 11 is the love chapter. God's love for us. And if you read Romans, it starts out pretty hard. Rotten sinners going to die. That's basically what it says. But then it quickly switches over to, yeah, but God loves you, and he's not going to let that happen to you, and he sent the Lord Jesus to make sure it doesn't happen. And then it walks through talking about God's love for us. The whole book. It's a beautiful book. And then in John 17, 23, you and me and I and them and all perfected into one. Big triangle with us in the middle. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. You guys are the children of the Most High God. Do you believe that? Dads love their kids. Moms, kind of like Jesus, loves their kids. Holy Spirit loves the kids. They love you deeply. They love you more than anything else in the universe. They love you as much as they love each other. It can be no other way because Scripture says God is love. 
I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about that outgoing concern that we have for others. Mothers will die to save their children. God died to save his children. Mothers have thrown cars off of their kids. Fathers have worked themselves to a bone to support their children so that they can go to college and have a better life. That's love. And that's the love that God has for us. And that love requires that he never separate himself from us. And he never will. Those two together are where we come up with our hopeful Unitarian thought. If God loves us that much and he will not separate us from us, and scripture says that his will is that none will perish, there's got to be a way that he's going to make everyone saved. Why is all that other stuff in scripture? Because he wants us to know how much he loves him. That he has decreed that if you sin, you will die. But that doesn't mean he's going to let anybody die. It helps us understand the seriousness of our action. The seriousness of our choice, which is life with God forever. Beauty, perfection, joy, happiness, spirit bodies, spirit minds, spirit souls. For eternity, or whatever the other might be, which is terrible. So I don't know how many of you are going to go see the Shack movie, but if you do, enjoy it. I would suggest you probably read the book first. I don't know if they're identical or not, but yeah, but we'll see. And when you're, if you watch that movie and read the book, realize that this is an attempt to help us get out of that old bottom line thinking, which is there. When you talk to people, it's not so much there in the Christian people. Because they've had time to realize that that's not quite so true. But in the world, and the people that are out there that are not part of Christianity, who haven't gone up and taken Dad's hand, who haven't stood up and are dancing with Dad, they really truly believe that God hates them, and that he doesn't love them, and he's not with them. They're alone. They believe that. So if there's any good that comes out of this, it will be that you can understand how they feel when you approach them about God. And to go with it and just start talking about Jesus and everything like that is probably not going to work very well. You've got to start out down at the gut level. Do you think God loves you? Do you think God is with you? Well, no, I don't. Do you know the story of Adam and Eve? Yes. Go through it a little bit with them. Oh, I can understand that. Because if you're talking to them, the Father is calling them. And if the Father is calling them, the Holy Spirit is there. And who's our teacher? Not me. Not the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit. And he uses crazy men like me, and he uses the scriptures to teach us. Remember, everything we believe is skewed, except Jesus. Jesus is Lord. He died for us. That is 100% sure of the gospel. So many of the other things are, and I know this for a fact, because I grew up in a church that taught one thing, right in the middle switch gears and went another direction. And guess what? We're still changing stuff. You learn this, and you go, oh, that is truly what God means. And that changes all this. Oh, if that means that, then this over here has to mean this. And we have to be willing to change. If you get to the point where I'm right and that's it, you're in trouble. Because basically what you've done is you've told the Holy Spirit, I don't want to learn anymore. I want to stay right where I am. And he'll leave you there. Of course, you'll be doing this, and he'll be dancing around you, and you'll be looking up and peeking, and eventually he'll get your attention again. So I'd like to close with a prayer. Our most holy Father, We've talked about a lot of things in these last three sermons, and a lot of it is quite different from what we have perceived in the past. And I know that some of this stuff may not be 100% accurate, but it does give us something else to think about, a different way to look at Scripture. You know, when we think about David and what he did, you allowed all that. 
And out of that came one of the greatest rulers Israel ever had, Solomon. David learned massively good lessons. And we realize that you, as God, have the right to do with us in any way, in anything you choose. Because you're the only one that can bring us back to life. Bathsheba's husband will live. The child will live. Everybody will have their chance to know you. But Father, we understand that your will is the only will that matters. And our job is to listen to the teaching of the Holy Spirit, become like Jesus, who is like you. And thereby we're becoming like you. Father, help us to keep our minds open. Help us to understand what is the truth is, and that is that Jesus is Lord, and through him we're all saved. That's a matter of faith. So, Father, bless us and guide us and give us strength through this week to consider these things, to look into the book of Romans, in the Romans, to look into different scriptures of the things that you say. And when we look at those scriptures to say, how does this show the steadfast love of God always being with me? It's there. It's there in the good deeds that come from that scripture. It's there in the words that are said. It's there in the interpretation. And we might, sometimes we have to go to different scriptures, different Bibles to kind of get an idea. Sometimes we have to go and look up what the word means. But the point is, you, Father, have sent us the Holy Spirit who teaches us. You, Father, have sent us the Lord God, Most High Jesus Christ, who came, lived, died, went back to heaven, and he is our big brother. We are a member of your family, and we are much, much loved. And our job, Father, and what we all desire the most is to love you as much as you love us. So, Father, bless us in that. Help us to understand that and help us to work towards that. Because once we start to love you the way you love us, our whole lives change. Because we don't worry about the things of this world anymore. We don't worry about our big fancy cars, big homes, our jobs. We worry about showing love to each other. We worry about good deeds, kindness, and gentleness, and helpful to everybody else. So, Father, bless our president that he will see these things, that he will realize what his job truly is, why he got elected. You chose him, Father. We know you did. You say you did. So, Father, make sure he does whatever it is you want him to do. Because, Father, he can be an excellent president. It's in him. It's there. You have to pull it out. So bless us all, Father, that everything will go well, and that you will give us strength to see you in all things and to love you and to know that you're with us always and never, ever feel alone or feel unloved, because that is just not the case. And we talk to you, and we ask you, and we praise you, and we thank you for being here today in the name of the one you sent to make it all possible for us, because you love us so much. Our Lord, our Savior, our soon-coming King, our big brother, and our best friend, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.